Good morning, everyone. Oh, gosh, you can do better than that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Um, I must say we are quite nervous, at least I am. And, um, but at the same time, excited. Um, these scholars here and um, contributors to the cause have put together presentations for us that are definitely um, worth listening to. I want to start off um, first by acknowledging the Coast Salish people whose land we are on and all the First Nation peoples with whom they coexist. Thank you for letting us be on the land. Um, and I would also like... Um, I would also like to thank the ABS organizers for giving the first panel um, of discussion to the First Peoples to speak about their issues and their language for themselves. Um, I really appreciated that. Thank you for doing that. And last but not least, I would like to thank them for um, inviting me to be part of this panel. Honestly, I didn't even think they knew me, so I was very surprised um, when I got the, the email uh, asking me to do it. So very humbled and um, really appreciate all of it. So we are going to move rather quickly because we have, um, like I said, exciting stuff that we are going to show you. Um, some of that includes a film that um, was asked for by popular request. So, and because of that, we are hoping that we will make the time and hopefully you'll be a little patient with us. But before that, um, I want to introduce the panel that's before you right now. Um, I'm a big believer in um, allowing God to let things line up as they're supposed to be. And when I was asked to choose a panel, I prayed about it. And the names that came to me, those are the people I sent emails to. And all of them said yes. And so I knew that was going to be. And, I, and then after that, it was simple. Um, they put together their presentations. However, um, for you who have um, schedule, who have the, what are, what are they called? Programs. You will see that there's a lady by the name of Xinyu Chang. Um, she was not able to come uh, due to unavoidable circumstances. However, when she called me yesterday morning, I told her, don't worry, I am sure something will happen. And so I came downstairs and um, there was Andrew. And I asked Andrew, would you please present something? He makes film, I've seen some of them. And I said, well, do you have something you would like to present? It so happened that he was here wondering if he could get an opportunity to present that film. <laughs> so um, he did not know what I was going to ask. And so um, as Jung, call, Jung calls it, it's synchronicity. So the panel here, I say, is handpicked by Baha'u'llah. The message they have to share with us is of import, I believe. So. Um, here, uh, right next to me is Alan Candle, and he is a student of elementary education at the University of Victoria, British Columbia, with a special interest in holistic and situated approaches to education. His participation in various Baha'i community building and educational initiatives at both formal and institutional and grassroots levels has also shaped this outlook in this endeavor. And Alan is very humble. He is really involved in the community. He is of great service um, for the Victoria community when he was there, so I know him and his work. Um, next to him, we have Tamara Martella. Um, she's a Vancouver-based vocalist, musician, educator, and painter. Um, she received her diploma in jazz studies from Vancouver Island University and trained as a classical flutist at the Victoria Conservatory of Music. Her studies have taken her to private study with top professionals in the music world to conventional study of pedagogy in, a conserv in the conservatory setting. As a recording artist, she has contributed to a range of diverse genres, including rap, 
rock, gospel, blues, and jazz, as well as vocals for commercial and television. Besides performing, Tamara has provided community children band programs for the last five years for young, inspiring musicians that do not have a band program in their schools. These children range from kindergarten age to age, to age not to grade eight, and her work has been to help guide children to the realization of their musical and personal potential, believing that children have a voice in this world that must be heard. Her program inspired, cr inspires creativity and self-expression and encourages them to become leaders and mentors to others in the process. Um, next to her is Dr. Payam Sazaga, and he is a member of the Vancouver Baha'i community. He is a clinical instructor in the Department of Family Practice at the University of British Columbia and works as a community family physician. He is also a, contra a contractor and physician for the Forensic Psychiatric Services Commission. Another um, great server of the cause, very humble, but really um, great server of the cause and efforts much appreciated. Down the line um, is Andrew Newell. Um, he has directed and written several short films and the feature length drama Looking for Truth. He served as an associate professor of film production at the Watkins College of Art and Design and Film for nine years. He is current, currently he was teaching digital filmmaking at Eagle Arts um, on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. He's also home pioneering in Florida. He forgot to mention that. So him and his family. Um, I was thinking, uh, maybe I should introduce myself as well. <laughs> should I? Okay. So, as you heard, um, my name is Maria Mutitu, and just for the kicks of it, it's Dr. Maria Mutitu now. Woo! Yay! I have to do that because um, anybody who knows me knows I was a foot into, into the psychiatric ward um, the last couple months, so that I made it through is awesome. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, Baha'u'llah. So as well, I am a member um, of the University of Victoria Faculty of Education. I'm in my teaching and research, um, mostly are in the areas of curriculum and instruction, um, especially in creating holistic working and learning spaces that are culturally, ethnically, linguistically, intellectually, psychologically, spiritually, and physically inclusive. Um, it's a work in progress, but we are trying. So basically it's teaching to the whole being. Um, currently I'm striving to incorporate the Baha'i writings into my research um, endeavors and also my teaching practice. So, Again, a work in progress. Um, for, this, for this panel, um, I am going to speak very briefly about my thoughts um, regarding the entire conference, which has been amazing. I don't know about you, but my cup is overflowing. And it's going to take a couple months to really um, hear it all and think about it. I need to percolate just to think about it. Um, and one of the things that I thought um, I might suggest, but mostly to myself, is to think about the lenses through which I, am, I have listened to, for example, the speakers today and every day in the breakout sessions. And by lenses, I mean um, the subconscious um, consciousness, if you want to call it that. Um, that forces us to make decisions or makes us make certain decisions, choose certain people, be attracted to certain colors, um, certain places, certain paths of service, those lenses and how they may influence what um, we heard today. And um, this area is very important to me because I tend to think um, too much and too quickly and I draw conclusions very fast, 
And most of the times, using my perceptions, I lead myself into a lot of trouble and mostly heartache. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, seeing the number, I mean, hearing the number of accents here, I know many of you have traveled into Canada or out of Canada, and the dilemma that comes with traveling in trying to figure out new worlds. And when I traveled from my home country of Kenya and came to school, many things were different and strange. Some were just outright, I had not seen before, they were new. And one of those things was the kinder sink that you push from below. Um, I had not seen those. We had the ones you open at the top and the water spouts out. So one day we were coming from a forum, which was where everybody gathered. And so people were thirsty and they were lining up to drink water from this fountain. And uh, most of them were Caucasian. And I noticed that every time they went and bent on the sink, water came out, right? So, and then I thought, wow, um, the first world is really amazing. It can sense somebody and just spurt out water. So the line moved on and moved on and I, it got to my turn and I bent and um, no water came up. <laughs> and I thought, okay, maybe I need to back up a little bit and come at it again. So I came, I bent. No water came out. Now, here is where the lenses are interesting. The lenses, growing up in Kenya, we had been taught that there was slavery and that there was desegregation and that there were times when people of color could not drink from certain um, water fountains. And um, I thought that not only is the first world intelligent, it has created sinks that know color. So, um, so I did. So I, so I bent and um, I did, and I, I, I tried it one more time. It still didn't come out. I'm like, I guess so. And I, of course, you don't ask these things. You people, who, if anybody who travels knows, usually it's embarrassing. So I continued, um, and from that day on, I would not drink from those faucets. So again, these are the lenses that I used. What I had been taught. What I knew. I made conclusions. Um, I began to get very suspicious of Caucasian people. I began to wonder about my place. I got nervous, um, almost to a point of sickness. It's all in the head. Um, and then three months later, um, I got a job as a janitor. And um, so while I was cleaning in the academic building, I, clean, I went to clean these faucets and lo and behold, at the bottom part was a big sign that said push. <laughs> so, um, and that's what I hadn't seen, is the sign called push. Um, that story distressed me then, it's funny now, but in retrospect, I realized that nothing in my life had prepared me to think about a water fountain that would have a push button at the bottom. Not only that, um, I did not have the awareness to investigate this further, right? I just drew instant conclusions based on the knowledge that I had. The knowledge was true, but I needed to have more knowledge. And um, in my life, there has been so many of those, it's quite embarrassing, but um, when it comes to the faith and matters of the faith, I find that um, I do do that as well. I will use my lenses that, you know, I grew up as a Presbyterian and I will use those lenses sometimes to look at the writings of Baha'u'llah. And I will use those to interpret. And every time I do that, I get disheartened, I get um, sad, I'm unable to fulfill the path I have chosen, and then I'm like, oh, this is not the Presbyterian church. This is Baha'u'llah's work. This is the New World Order. So um, I wanted to just add that um, each and every one of us have our own cultures of our, you know, homes, cultural backgrounds, education, um, our own pet peeves that we love, but to be even more aware to immerse ourselves in the writings of Baha'u'llah so that they become 
the lenses through which we perceive the world. Yeah. Um, and having said that, I will now, we will start, um, the, the panel will begin to talk, and I would just let them go through all the way to the end. So, off you go, Alan. Thanks. Can you, yeah, you hear? Yeah. Um, it's so wonderful to see everyone. I think we all have been so blessed to be at this conference. And um, just, uh, it's really a lot of learning. And you know you're learning because sometimes it's, um, it's quite intense. And when you're shifting, there's a lot, you know, in education we call it dissonance but it's, it's a good thing, and then I think that's how, you know, um, then we learn more, we grow, right? Um, um, I'm a student at University of Victoria. Um, I see Maria in the coffee shop sometimes, I'm lucky. Um, and I've been studying elementary education. I've been in the program for one year, last year, and I did some studies at college. Um, and I guess it's been a long journey. My, um, I guess education of life is, uh, my, my mom is a, t a teacher, but my parents both met, they were doing forestry and in Cameroon. And um, so I grew up in many different countries. And I, I think that has an influence also our education when we go to different places. As Maria was saying, it's very different. Um, but um, basically I was thinking, about this talk and really preparing just three parts. The first part was just, just to say like, how do we see education in the faith? And then how maybe do we see education at universities or what is the discourse? And lastly, um, what is this new mode or model of education that the Baha'i community that um, especially as we see emerging the institute process, um, what have I learned from that? And um, so to begin with, um, Baha'u'llah says, regard man as a mine, rich in gems of inestimable value. And education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit therefrom. I think this is a very powerful, um, powerful writing and really um, draws us our vision um, to really try and, and see each person and especially each child in that way as this mind rich in gems, that they already are a treasure, that they already have come with all they, all they need. And, um, but that in this world, it's, it's the task of manifesting um, these spiritual um, potentials and treasures. Um, and of course, like the House of Justice says, that the children are our community are the most precious treasure. Um, so, when, you know, so growing up in a Baha'i background, when I went to college, well, I went, I went to, I should say, I went to a Baha'i school. I went to Maxwell International Baha'i School. And so, our worldview, our education was really shaped by that. We had scholars, we had teachers, we had members of institutions come to the school. Um, the people running the school, the whole um, atmosphere was based on the oneness of mankind, service to humanity. Um, we had programs that went out also to reach out to other schools and other people. And so that really, I think, I really absorbed a lot of that and really um, enrich, it's a, it's a rich education. And um, after that, um, well, I had a lot of plans. I, I have a lot of ideas in general. I, like Maria saying, I think too much about things. Um, and um, it took, took me a while before I kind of decided what I was going to do. Um, um, yeah, eventually, um, well, I was actually ill. And when I got better, I decided, I, well, I went and visited. Actually, I went to Haifa for a three-day visit. And on the way, I, I, um, I was in Scotland, and I met some relatives. And one of my relatives was, uh, he's called David, and at that time he was, he was five years old. 
And just being with him, just being with his love, his joy, his questions were so, like, just smart. And, and just being with him, I was like, you know what? I love, I love children, and, I love, and there's, they have so much to teach us. And so that's kind of what got me started, thinking, okay, maybe I'll start with education. This is a good foundation. And um, so um, I'll skip ahead. So when I was in university, I think what has really been um, what's interesting is that a lot of these things that we're talking about, like how we see the human being, like focusing on the child, focusing on cognitive, the affective, the psychomotor, like the whole aspect of human nature, those things they are talked about, but there's not, it's very difficult to have a discourse. So I mean, people in your class sometimes, um, do we create spaces for this? And also, is it practiced? And I think that's been really, for me anyways, it was somewhat frustrating at first. And I had some professors who would really take us to schools. And my university is very good. They're really trying to get students to go to schools and learn through being in schools, learn through, through actually practicing, um, not, not just um, the concept or theory. Um, and so for example, I remember a time we went to a school and we were teaching PE and some of the kids had disabilities and um, some of the girls in my class, they didn't really want to be with those kids. And I thought, well, like, you know, you're a teacher, we have to really reach to everyone. Um, but I think what I have learned um, has a lot been from the Baha'i community, and especially participating in projects, outreach, working with, say, children, junior youth. Um, I was very lucky to go to Toronto. My sister lives there. And just when we go out and we are really, you really pray a lot, and just to, to be able to be that pure channel, have that spirit, and meet people, and the conversations that you have, it's really incredible. Um, and it's not, it really, for me, and it's still recent, it's like really reshaping what is knowledge. Because Baha'u'llah tells us there's two kinds of knowledge, divine, satanic, and one is from the heart, and the other is acquired knowledge which gets in the way of the heart. It's not that knowledge is a bad thing, but if it gets in the way of, of our openness of, to, to receive and to be able to share. Um, and so just when we meet people, um, and even when I was in Victoria, just meeting this girl at the bus stop, the knowledge that people have, the um, insight, um, I think, I just, I think there's so much potential in in the plan, in the guidance the House of Justice is giving us, and it may be hard first, but we really, the more that we um, contribute, the more that we try, the more that we will learn from it. Um, and indeed, Baha'u'llah says that the light of the covenant is the educator of the hearts, the minds, and the souls of men. Um, so I haven't talked too much about how we bring those two together. I feel that we'll learn a lot more about that um, when we're doing both. When we're both working at, in our professions, our um, university, our work, and so on, and, and creating a discourse, learning what kind of questions to ask, how to, what's the skill of conversation, and, and really like friendship, like solidarity with people, unity. Um, and then also when we're working in our Baha'i communities, um, those two things I, I'm sure will go together. Um, yeah, that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, my name is Tamara, and I just wanted to first start off. Uh, four years ago, I was brought to the faith by the arts. I feel I'm more creative now than I ever have been in my entire life. Yabahalapa. I'm just gonna do a little name dropping at this moment. The first Baha'i I ever met was Dizzy Gillespie. The first Baha'i I actually consciously met was Dizzy Gillespie. And I met him just before he passed, I think it was in the year of 1992. And I draw on him, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, Einstein, Carl Jung, uh, anybody I can <laughs> from the supernal realm because I truly do believe it works. And I know that it does. 
My short talk this morning will be from the heart, but it is set up somewhat like a science experiment with an objective observations and conclusion. My findings to date have been through my 25 years of pedagogical experience. I was going to start off with two quotes by Abdul, two, one, two quotes, one by Abdul Baha and one by Baha'u'llah. But instead, I was convinced this morning to uh, chant a prayer instead. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. This is my son, Marcello's favorite prayer. And I have Kleenex on hand, just in case. You might want to get some. I don't know. Um. He is God. Oh, God. My God. Bestow upon me a pure Like unto a pearl, like unto a pearl, like unto a pearl, I Blessed is that teacher who shall arise to instruct the children. I am blessed and I do consider my work to be worship because it brings me absolute great joy. My objective with these children is empowerment, mining the gems of inestimable value, help develop their own inner authority to be able to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, help them understand that there are no bad people, just bad behaviors, and that they are creations of God and they are here in this world to create and that their life is a work of art. A tall order, but definitely doable. That was supposed to be funny, but I guess. <laughs> Don't take me too seriously. <laughs> I'm a musician and mornings are a little hard. Um, and I'm tired. Because <laughs> I couldn't sleep, I haven't slept for... I've just been so inspired by all of the, the lectures that I'm constantly changing everything that I've been writing down. Um, how did I go about this task, you may ask? Outside school time is a private class after school. I could do what I wanted and how I wanted. My observations have been so far, when students have opportunities to talk about the world they want for their future and the future of their own families, they want peace, no wars, no fighting, families to stay together and love one another. Children want and need to feel safe and supported to flourish. And this is my job as a human being and as a mother to create this environment. My classes were made up of a very diverse group of children. The class's main focus was that of unity. We did everything together, field trips, concerts, etc. No one was turned away from the class ever, and inclusiveness was top priority. Teaching class with varying degrees of musical knowledge is exciting. When teaching a class with varying degrees of learning abilities and a wide range of ages, a teacher has to become a supreme multitasker. I am a Virgo, so that works just fine, and I'm used to doing 10 things at once. As you see, I have two screens. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, let's see, where am I at? Okay. Give children, this is one of the things, it was so fascinating to watch, and I loved it. Give children two minutes once a week to scream their heads off in a large room, preferably one separate from all the other buildings, and you will see them get overjoyed because they are always told to be quiet. And now there is some teacher telling them, go ahead, get it out of your system. By the way, boys can scream higher than girls, and it is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I have the best job in the world. I do. I had a class once that had a student with Tourette's OCD and autism. Quite the cocktail. It was very stressful, and it gave me a very small taste of what a parent must go through on a daily basis, dealing with exclusivity and people being afraid of their child due to misunderstanding him and the world he lives in. Before the child came to class, we consulted as a class together. I wanted the children to understand that everyone has the right to education and that this student loved music and we were going to try it out for a bit and to see if it was a good fit. Um, this child goes to a school called Nanamuni Kids Organization 
It wasn't that great of a fit due to the profanity that had occurred, and I did not know until the first class. But I have now offered um, NUCO the opportunity to have a music program for children because it's very difficult to integrate um, children that have specific um, things that other people like profane language and you know Tourette's is, is very different for a lot of children and what they do and when you have children that are like five and six years old you really don't want them hearing those words um, but you have to try things out and it's as, as I said my presentation this morning is somewhat of an experiment and that's what I that's what I learned and um, I'm glad that I did experience that Success arises, another, uh, another observation, when we create win-win situations that everything is a victory no matter how big or small. From playing three notes in a row all in one breath, memorizing a piece of music, starting and ending a piece together, and also refraining from smacking the person next to you. <laughs> together we are all going to learn about music, including me, acquire spiritual qualities, including me, and learn to work together. It was inevitable. This was done through the art. When situations arose regarding, regarding bullying, abuse, and deaths in the family, these issues would be thoroughly discussed. You're wondering, when are they teaching music in this class? We, we did. This just was organic. Um, we would ask ourselves, why does this occur, and how can we grow to understand these things? I remember the first time the who is God question came up. It was very interesting. My class consisted of children from various religious backgrounds, indigenous spirituality, Christians, Baha'is, a Buddhist, and one girl that said God was a woman. We talked about God being a noble essence and we cannot know our creator. She said as far as she was concerned, God was a woman and she had her own reasons for her thinking and was not willing to share them at this time. <laughs> children are amazingly autonomous at different levels. Uh, I'm glad you find this funny, because I was hoping so. Two of the children um, had lost their grandmother in a fire, and the whole community was upside down by this. Sometimes your class objective changes due to your students. It's like doing Ruhi. Uh, the tutor is the accompanist, and the participants are the singer, and the accompanist always follows the singer. I had to follow the pulse and pace of my class with the utmost love and support. This was done through music. This always led to beautiful discussions about belief systems. Because we are all working on our spiritual qualities while learning an instrument, we were able to discuss as a group what we were taught to believe, what we think we might, but might be true, and what we really believed, even if that meant believing in fairies for the time being, and this was done through music. One child in my class had only the sight of one eye and also had fetal alcohol syndrome. When he came to class, he was introverted and didn't want to take part after the entire class. Uh, well, sorry, I just wanted my two-minute thing here. When he came to class, he was introverted and didn't want to take part. After the entire class working together, supporting him, he could express his joy of music. He began to acquire more self-esteem, see himself as an important part of his family we had created together. He and his sister would open up our concerts with a prayer, singing and playing the drum was what their father had passed down to them and this gave them great joy and happiness to share this with all of us. At times, it was truly an emotional moment, undescribable. It also gave rise to other children wanting to bring something from their culture to share in class. What if I go over my two minutes, Maria? What? It's one now. It's one now. Okay, well, I am at my conclusion then. I was a catalyst and nothing more. I learned more than the children. The children in my classes were given a place that was safe and supportive, which gave them the opportunity to create and not to worry about judgment or criticism. They experimented and they played. They learned that empowerment and assertiveness is allowed. It was their right. They had the power to change things around them no matter their age. They learned that they have the power to change the world starting with themselves. When they see injustice, they can stand for their beliefs and be respected for them that they are their own person and are not an extension of their parents and their parents' personality. Children need to know that they deserve to be a happy and joyful being and to share that with others through their deeds. I was transformed as an educator and a spiritual being and will continue to be. I am privileged to have been able to watch children become beautiful human beings right before my eyes. Teaching children is the most amazing experience you can have. 
these transformations happen through the arts. Thank you. So, um, my name is Payam, and I'm going to speak today um, about an ongoing project of the Baha'i Medical Association of Canada, uh, which I'm involved with, um, based on my experiences as an educator and working with my Baha'i colleagues in the medical profession. And um, this project or curriculum is called the Spiritual Foundations of Health, and it's an attempt to promote systematic study of the Baha'i teachings that relate to spirituality and health. And um, this is a curriculum that's still being developed and piloted by the Baha'i Medical Association and its local chapters in cities across Canada, um, and re represents one way to promote scholarship in the medical profession. Uh, before I, I begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, the rest of the Executive Committee of the Baha'i Medical Association, especially Dr. Joanne Langley, whose initiative six, seven years ago really helped get this project off the ground. So the objectives of the Spiritual Foundations of Health is to create a curriculum for spirituality and medicine, a spirituality and medicine course based on the Baha'i writings, and to advance a discourse in a popular area of contemporary thought in medical education and practice. And this is inspired uh, by our terms of reference from the National Spiritual Assembly um, to make available the principles of the Baha'i faith with the objective of contributing to healing and well-being at all levels, individual, family, societal, and global, to medical and other health professionals who provide services, research, and training in the health field. The content of this curriculum is uh, very uh, similar to that of the Ruhi Institute. Um, it consists of Baha'i writings, um, Baha'i quotations with exercises similar to that of the Ruhi Institute, which include questions based on the quote, true and false, fill in the blanks, and more reflective questions. And participating in this uh, project involves really going through the same three stages we go through in the Institute, uh, study, action, and reflection. And the study component of it involves studying the curriculum as well as relevant sections of the Ruhi Institute, especially book one. And the action component involves applying this material to real life case scenarios and having participants in our groups uh, create new case scenarios, and then doing practice exercises, which are simple lines of action inspired by the Baha'i teachings. And the reflection component of this happens in the small groups, which we call our uh, BMAC, or Baha'i Medical Association of Canada chapters, as well as at the individual level. And we follow this process um, employed in the Ruhi Institute because it's proven to be so effective. And this initiative we feel is a fairly timely one because the culture of medical association, um, or the culture of medical education is such that most medical schools um, in North America try to incorporate uh, spirituality in some form into their curriculum. And many primary care medicine and nursing journals have published articles on spirituality in medicine, as well colleges of medicine um, across the country always seek ways to teach professionalism at the medical school and graduate, um, postgraduate uh, training level. And when I talk about professionalism, um, it really involves what is expected of someone who's a professional. And a definition provided um, in a recent article in the Journal of the American Medical Association is uh, professional competence is a habitual and judicious use of communication, knowledge, technical skills, clinical reasoning, emotions, values, and reflection in daily practice for the benefit of the individual and the community being served. And this curriculum, the Spiritual Foundations of Health, really consists of three units. 
And the first unit is actually related to the theme of this conference, understanding the nature of human existence. And in this unit, we cover topics including the purpose of life, the nature of human beings, the purpose of health, the purpose of illness, and the nature of suffering. And in the second unit, we, we study the nature of medical practice, including the roles of research and um, the harmony of science and religion, and the different kinds of healing that exist and how healing happens according to a Baha'i perspective. And the third unit is really about professionalism or the responsibilities of physicians. And in this unit, we study quotations about work is worship, and the station of service, teamwork, and other important aspects of professionalism. So the, um, I'm just going to, I know we're, um, we don't have that much time, I'm just gonna provide a couple uh, quick examples. So in the first section um, where we study um, human nature from a Baha'i perspective, um, there's one quote by Baha'u'llah in Gleadings, where Baha'u'llah says, Know thou that the soul of man is exalted above and is independent of all infirmities of body and mind. That a sick person showeth signs of weakness is due to the hindrances that interpose themselves between the soul and his body. For the soul itself remaineth unaffected by any bodily ailments. Consider the light of the lamp. Though an external object may interfere with its radiance, the light itself continueth to shine with undiminished power. As well, um, there's a quote following that about mental illness where the House of Justice says in Lights of Guidance, mental illness is not spiritual, although its effects may indeed hinder and be a burden in one striving towards spiritual progress. So then the exercises in this unit would consist of simple questions based on the quotation like, is a soul affected by illness? What prevents the soul of a sick person from manifesting its inherent might and power? And then we would have memorization activities. And then uh, participants would be provided with a real, um, real life case scenario where, for example, you may have a patient who's suffering from mental illness and is feeling demoralized and hopeless. And Participants are asked to reflect on the previous questions and identify spiritual principles that would assist in caring for this person. Again, not as a substitute for routine medical treatment, but rather um, to foster a more holistic approach to care. And following uh, case scenarios, participants are provided um, with suggestions for practice. And these are simple lines of action based um, on the Baha'i teachings, such as visiting someone in their home and studying the short healing prayer, praying for your patients at the beginning of every workday, um, considering donating a Baha'i prayer book to your hospital chapel, or hosting a devotional gathering in your hospital chapel, and so on. So that's one example of one of the sections in the Spiritual Foundations of Health. Another quick example I'll share with you um, this is under the section on professionalism. And there's, in Tablets of Baha'u'llah, um, in a loving letter that the master writes to a physician who's just received his diploma to practice, Abdul Baha says, for the physician, the first qualifications are good intentions, trustworthiness, tenderness, sympathy for the sick, truthfulness, integrity, and fear of the Lord. And then the exercise, ask participants to give examples of how they as physicians could exemplify these qualifications. Um, so to summarize um, briefly, um, the Spiritual Foundations of Health curriculum, which we are um, piloting in Vancouver and other places in Canada, is still very much a work in progress. And it involves engaging um, in a study of the writings on spirituality and health, which is something that medical students and professionals do anyways in their deepenings and study classes. But this, um, we hope, will provide a refined curriculum based on the collective experience of like-minded individuals and incorporate ways to translate 
the knowledge that is learned into practical lines of action based on the Baha'i teachings. And we hope that this process um, will help spiritualize the way in which we practice healthcare. Maria, thank you very much for including me in this panel at the last minute. I, I didn't have the heart to tell you that I was actually in the lobby uh, looking for a water fountain that worked. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Um, it's an honor to share this uh, work with you, my dear brothers and sisters that we're about to show. Uh, a work of art is a work of love. And in the case of a film, it is collective love made manifest. Since none of the many cast and crew members of this project, with the exception of my courageous, compassionate, and creative wife, could be here, on their behalf, I offer you their gift of love. The film is called Faith in Common and drew inspiration from the One Common Faith document released by the beloved Universal House of Justice several years ago. I served as the writer and director on this project. Our intention was to create something useful. It is my deepest, most ardent prayer that you find it such. And in fact, I, I want to ask uh, your assistance because I'm looking for ways to use this project in all aspects of community life. So if you have an idea, I would love to hear it. And if you could find me afterwards, um, please share with me your thoughts. <laughs> 